The third point is that within this pers perspective, the central ethical category, horizon, turns out to be respect for otherness. That, as if, you know, that's the ultimate horizon. Here, let me quote Alain Badiou from an interview he made with uh, this art journal Cabinet, where he made a point with which I agree. Quote, I must particularly insist that the formula respect for the other has nothing to do with any serious definition of good and evil. What does respect for the other mean when one is at war against an enemy, when one must judge the work of a mediocre artist, when science is faced with obscurantist sects? sects. Very often it is the respect for others which is injurious, which is evil, especially when it is resistance against others or even hatred of others that drives a subjectively just action, end of quote. Now, the obvious liberal reproach here would have been, but do Badiou's own examples not display the limit of his Badiou's logic? Yes, hatred for the enemy, intolerance towards false wisdom, but it's not the big lesson of the 20th century of totalitarian experience that even and especially when we are caught in such a struggle, we should respect a certain limit, the limit precisely of the other's radical otherness. Is it not that we should never reduce the other to an enemy, to the bearer of false knowledge or whatever? Is it not that there is always in every figure of the other an impenetrable abyss of radical otherness, almost a kind of absolute? The 20th century totalitarianism, with its millions of victims, shows, this would be the liberal criticism, I think, the ultimate outcome, catastrophic outcome, of following to the end what appears to be a subjectively just action. But I think that this precisely, now it's me who is speaking, no longer the liberals to avoid confusion, this is uh, the reasoning that we should reject. Let me take the extreme case, a mortal violent struggle against a fascist enemy. Should one display here a respect for the abyss of the radical otherness of Hitler's personality and so on, it is here I think that one should apply Christ's well-known words about how he brings swords and division, not unity and peace. Out of the very love for humanity, inclusive whatever remained of humanity in Nazis themselves, one should fight them in an absolutely ruthless, respectless way. In short, the Jewish saying, often quoted, like in Schindler's list, apropos Holocaust, you know that well-known wisdom, when somebody saves one man alone from death, one saves entire humanity. It may sound strange, but I think it should be supplemented with, when one kills only one true enemy of humanity, one saves entire humanity. That's the more difficult part to accept. The true ethical test is not only the readiness to save victims, but perhaps even more, the ruthless dedication to annihilate those who made them victims. Now, what, back to this celebration of multitude, what this emphasis of, on multitude and diversity masks is, of course, the underlying monotony of today's global life. I think this is the ultimate fake of multiculturalism, this emphasis, different lifestyles, and so on, that is basically all the same. How then is this concealed? I think through another key feature of contemporary ideology, which is the constant ironic undermining of every identification. The point today, the way authority functions today, it's how. Do you see the movie, it's a ridiculous movie, but I like it, with Bruce Willis, The Unbreakable, where you know the ridiculous story, the hero discovers that he is in real life an invincible uh, cartoon hero, and the problem is that it's difficult for him to assume this mandate, whatever. And I think this is how generally authority today's function, today's boss, no longer says, I insist on order, you must obey me, and then behind his back you make fun at him. Today's boss comes to you, makes obscene jokes, embraces you, and so on, but he nonetheless remains the boss. So, in a closer look, how does this ideology function? Let me take another example from Hollywood, which gives us the other aspect of today's dominant ideology. Uh, this recent, uh, again, animated blockbuster, big success, uh, Shrek. You know what it is. 
It's a cartoon about the standard. It's a standard fairy tale story. The hero and his endearingly confused comic helper go and defeat the dragon and save the princess from its clutches. But if you saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about. This story is coated in joking, subversive effects. Almost sometimes it looks as, but it's not. Brechtian, verfremdungen, extraneations, ironic self-referential comments. For example, you know, when at the end the couple marry, or in the middle, sorry, the couple is supposed to marry in the church, you see people applauding, but then you see that, that uh, servants of the king are giving stage direction, like applaud, respectful silence, and so on. Or, for example, the two lovers kiss, the ugly ogre and the beautiful princess. But instead of the standard story where the ugly guy, frog, whatever, turns into a beautiful prince, here is the beautiful princess who turns into an ugly peasant woman so that they can be happy couple and so on and so on. So we get all these reversals. For example, even the dragon turns out to be a caring female who later helps the heroes. We have anachronic references to modern culture and so on and so on. So how are we to read it? I can imagine a Judith Butler reading, which would be, yeah, yeah, these are displacement, reinscription, another site of resistance, you know. Uh, I don't think that it is. I think that this film perfectly exemplifies how ideology functions today. The key focus for me is that with all these jokes, displacement, blah, 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 the same old story is being told. And I think that the function of all these displacement jokes is precisely to render the traditional narrative palpable for our time. The function of all these jokes is profoundly reactionary. It is to prevent us from asking why not telling another story. It's precisely a way for the same story to go on. So no wonder that the finale of the film consists of the ironic version of the old monkey's hit, monkey's was the band, from the 60s, I'm a believer. This is how we are today believers. We make fun of ourselves while continuing, we make fun of our beliefs while continuing to practice them. So let me now conclude. I'll probably already speak for 10 minutes now, I mean, for my non-linear notion of time. OK, I move to the last part now. Uh, what conclusions should we make from this situation? The first one, I think, one should uh, fight a certain attitude, which was again perfectly designated by Chesterton, this attitude which is at a different levels, of course, practice in our public lives, in our usual secular lives, but also in the radical academia. It's, did you notice how it, with many so-called radical academics, you have one stylistic prohibition, which is the prohibition to firmly assert your position. You are not allowed to say, this is it. You are allowed to say, and you have these dozens of rhetoric variations, like usually it's a rhetorical question. Might we not risk the claim that under certain conditions it could be possible to propose that then woman is a symbolic construction, not a natural category, whatever. But that's how it is. So always, as if in order to make a statement, you must always add a qualification. But I don't mean really it if, of course, I mean it self-critically, and so on and so on. I think that the falsity of this attitude was again denounced by Chesterton, a wonderful quote, the last one, don't be worried. Uh, at any street corner, we may meet a man who utters the frantic, blasphemous statement that he may be wrong. Every day, one comes across somebody who says that, of course, his views may not be the right ones. Of course, his views must be the right ones, or they are not his views. End of quote.